Okay, so cost accounting and cost management in a lean environment. So this is where we look at the fourth type of production. Remember we talked about job batch flow. Now we're going to talk about just in time. Now the key point is that just in time is really not a production technique only. It's a philosophy. It's a philosophy that centers around the elimination of waste. So especially if you're going to look at this area of inventory. So you can see what I told you, if you can reduce the amount of inventory, it will reduce the cost of financing. If you can bring it as close as possible to zero, it will be really good. Because that will be the lowest cost. So some time-honored traditional management accounting practices <coughs> to the CR hindrance the practice of JIT and will be considered a waste. For example, writing out work orders, we see that that could be considered a waste of time. Okay, so elimination of waste is the philosophy behind JIT. Okay, so it's a philosophy having four fundamental aspects. First of all, all activities that do not add value to a product are eliminated. Now, that's the interesting thing about this added value, because the a product a, a activity that does not add value is simply defined as something that a customer will not pay you more money for. Okay? So for example, doesn't mean you haven't got to do it. When I send a product back saying that the staple is in the wrong place, okay, or you all had staple too many products together, you had to remove that staple and put the new staple on, that had to be done, but I was not going to pay you any more money for that. The money I was going to pay you is exactly the same as if you had done it properly. Okay, so the word non-value non added activity is an activity for which the customer is not going to pay you any extra money for doing it. Okay, now this reminds me of a, of a story, and for the ladies here, excuse me, but it's about a lady who went to a restaurant and she ordered some soup and when she was having the soup she dropped her spoon. So she called the waiter and said, can I have another spoon? And the waiter opened his jacket and he had spoons, knives, forks in his jacket and took the spoon and gave it to the lady. So she was very impressed. She said, my God, normally by the time you go back and get a spoon and come, my soup is cold. How come you're carrying all these things in you? He said, Madam, we have a CMA over here. And they said that bringing a spoon is a non value any exercise because I can't put the extra charge for the spoon on the bill. So I have to go there and bring you a spoon, but I cannot charge you more. So now I carry the spoon with me and I give it. And by doing that, I've saved the company $100,000 a year in, in reducing wasted time. So she was very impressed. Now, a little later, she noticed that all the waiters had a little string attached to their zips of their trousers. So she called the waiter and said, what is that string doing there? He said, Madam, that's the second wasted time exercise, non value exercise, because when we go to the bathroom, we have to do what we have to do, but then we have to wash our hands. And washing our hands, we can't look on the bill, so that's a non-value any exercise. So now what do we do? We pull the string, the string is attached to the top of our underwear, and everything falls out and we can do what we have to do, no washing of hands required. So she was very impressed, my God. Okay, we have saved the company so much of money. Then she said, but, but, but how do you get it all back in? And then he told, Madam, I don't know about the others, but I use the spoon. <laughs> okay. So be careful when you order a spoon from now on in a restaurant. Okay, make sure it's not a considered a non value exercise. So that's the point. Okay, you cannot charge the customer for that activity. Okay, that's point all your restaurant eating from now on. Right. So there's a high commitment to a, uh, there's a commitment to a high level of quality. 
continuous improvement in the efficiency of activity we strive for, all the time improving. And the fourth thing is that there's high visibility. Now you can see from what's on top of your table in the middle, that's where I asked you how to draw your scrap, is the visibility of the value adding and non-value adding activities. So these are the four fundamental aspects. Now JIT, as you know, is a continuous elimination of waste, most notably elimination of raw material inventories by direct delivery to the work machine. So what they do is that they do not have, in the old way, deliver it to a raw material store. They instead deliver direct to the, to the manufacturing floor. So going back to the earlier flow map, uh, technique, you can see that suppliers come here, the raw material depositor is taken to the production floor, produce, finished goods builds up, and you then try to sell it to the customer. So this type of production goes in that direction. It is called push. Okay, pushers. Okay, now you will see the thing that happens in, in uh, JIT is that they actually try to eliminate raw material inventories by directly them to the machine, elimination of working process by reducing batch sizes ideally to one through flexible manufacturing systems, elimination of scrap and rework by total project. These are components, so these two are eliminated by very good quality management. Elimination of material handling by redesigning the shop floor lines, and elimination of finished goods inventories by product being made to order. So let's start from the back. You see that first of all, they don't have any raw material and the finished goods <coughs> because they don't make anything until the customer orders. You remember I gave you the Dell example? Until the customer orders, nothing is manufactured. If there's no order, the production flow stops. People are sent to do gardening duties. Okay, so customer must order first. And the moment the customer orders, the production flow starts. So this is why it's called pull. It goes in the other direction, pull production. Okay, because until you get a customer order, nothing happens. And then the production flow is pulled into operation. <coughs> On this end, you can see that you don't have a raw material store anymore. Under ideal conditions, the suppliers will bring their pre-inspected components straight to the production floor. Now this of course means that there is going to be three, four, five deliveries per day. Okay. That is from supply delivery to the production, to the uh, straight to the manufacturing floor. Now, of course, in countries like Thailand and Indonesia, and now increasingly Dubai, you're going to have a problem with this because of traffic jams. Okay, so how do you avoid traffic jams, okay, and still have JIT suppliers? Well, what you do is, you have essentially what is called an industrial park, where you have the main manufacturing center in the middle, say, it is a Ford Motor Company, and then you have lots of your component suppliers, around you, these well away from the main city center, where they will come without any traffic control, okay, three, four, five times a day. So the components of that, that are individual companies, are set up right around the main house. These are industrial parks. Okay, so of course there's going to be problems. If one of these suppliers goes on strike, I'll, I'll keep 
Suppliers, one of them may go on strike. Okay, now this is exactly what happened in in Australia when the seed belt manufacturer went on strike, and both Holden and Ford had only 14 minutes of stock left. Okay. Okay, so what happened was they had to stop production. Now that Coca-Cola manufacturer uh, never got a job again, and all those people who went on strike for higher pay, they lost their jobs. So these are typically what's going to happen. Okay, so you can see elimination of raw material stores by direct delivery, elimination of finished goods by only making it to a custom order, full production happening, and because of good total quality management, you're going to have a reduction, or hopefully elimination, of any requirement for rework Okay, and yield loss. So this is the concept at least of just in time. Okay, so whatever inventory there is would be only the last hour of inventory on the production floor at the end of each day. That's the only inventory that they would be holding. Okay, so there are many aspects of production that need to work together effectively if this goal is to be reached. If this idea is going to be reached. Production scheduling and planning. Material and procurement planning, must have the right materials at the right time. Shop floor layout, it has to be laid out in such a way that flow lines are very easy. Machine setup times, this is a big one. Machine setup times, we had to reduce significantly, no longer long, long time to wait to set up a machine to do a component. Production engineering, total quality control. All of these areas must work together to achieve this GIP philosophy. These assets have caused significant change in operations. Thus, consideration should be given to change the company accounting system, cost accounting system. So as I showed you before, these things have changed from very heavy direct labor to indirect costs to a small amount of direct labor. So starting with flow production in the early days, <coughs> moving on to flexible manufacturing systems, moving on to port to quality management, and now, as you can see, GIP philosophies. Costs in most organizations, large part of it is indirect costs or shared costs. If your accounting system hasn't kept pace, they're going to have problems in the number that is reported. So let's look at some areas. Now, typical problems that are there in any manufacturing flow, in the past or even today, is supplies taking a long time to deliver. The quality of the delivered components have to be checked. We want to get the best possible prices. And the production flow, lots of errors and inflexibility. So there is a traditional solution and a JIT solution. The traditional solution for supply lead times was to have lots and lots of raw material stocks and large batch sizes to get volume discounts that you had in the bin. But GIT solution is close the relationship to suppliers. Somewhere in the north you see that Apple went from something like 3,000 suppliers to about 80 suppliers or something like that. It very huge change. Close the relationship to suppliers, smaller but direct, frequent deliveries, to workstations. So as I told you, straight to the workstation. So same problem, different solution. Quality of delivered components. In the old days, you had it be delivered to the uh, factory and to the stores, unpacked, checked, they put on a shelf, inspection and quality control at point of delivery. Now it is pre-inspected. After you do your supplier training and so on, 
the suppliers are supposed to pre-inspect. Okay, and then if there's a problem, they're going to go to trouble because that, that responsibility has been passed on to the suppliers, and you are going to pay a little higher price for it, but still it saves the cost of doing that. Price maintenance at point of purchase. How do you get good prices? By having multiple suppliers and discounts of our orders. In the case of JIT, few single suppliers provide small, frequent, high quality deliveries in return for long term contracts. So each component has not more than one supplier, at least only a few, so that you get these are called smart contracts, okay? but it's long term contracts. So although the price may be not the cheapest, it is a fixed price for a longer period of time. Inflexible production and errors of the production flow has resulted in carrying a lot and lots of working process awaiting reworking, like in the case of the uh, clean share. So changes from push production to pull production and a lot of material resource plan to lots and lots of ERP system are used here. Two more problems, long setup times and poor production flow layout. So in the old days, it took a long time to set up a machine, because once you want to set up a machine, you have to set the thing up even for a component, and therefore once you set it up, you want to do lots and lots of that component. Okay, so this is large quantities, because it takes so long to set up a machine. But now, flexible manufacturing systems. Ideal lot size is just one. Enormous attention paid to reducing setup time. Now the famous example that I'm quoting here is that of Toyota. When Toyota wanted to reduce its setup times for the gearbox manufacturing, they sent their engineers to Volkswagen. Some people call it Volkswagen, but it's Volkswagen in Germany. And they found that they were taking eight hours to set up a machine to do the gearbox, but Volkswagen was taking four hours. So initially they asked the engineers to do it in four hours, which the engineers did. They were said, well done, now do it in two hours continuously pull, which they did. And they went on like that, well done, now reduce it, now reduce it, until finally they got it in three minutes. Okay, now don't expect the same machinery that was being used for setting up a machine in four hours to be the machinery used to set up in three minutes. There was lots and lots of purchasing of flexible manufacturing systems, robotics, and computer workstation and so on. Okay, so it's not the same machinery. But they, they believe that putting money, a lot of money here, is still worth it if they can reduce the inventory costs over there for their type of manufacturing. Okay, so that is there the trade-off happens. Okay, then lastly, poor production layout, high working cross inventory in queue, a typical European plant even today it has 50% of working process in queue awaiting delivery to the next workstation. And that's a huge figure. It has improved a little bit, but not much. But what the JIT solution is far better shop flow layout, ergonomics, material handling, and flexible ma machines. Okay, so you can see that Teneco example, the old factory, very large amount of working process. The new factory in China, they were to do it much faster. Okay, as you can see, same problem, different solution. Okay, so where does cost management come in? Now, why we need good cost management is that we need more accurate product cost information for pricing, contracting, product mix. We need better control of our cost incurrence. The idea focus is on reducing the total cost of an organization. Reduced cost of the system itself. So we want to not only use the GIT philosophy to reduce inventory, but we also want to use it to reduce the cost of running the cost accounting system. Okay. So that's an interesting one. How do you reduce the cost of costing? Okay. So, 
Why do we need the changes? We need cost economy for good cost planning. Planning is your budgeting. So the aim is to design the product and the production that the mix of cost, quality, deliverability, and flexibility. This must reflect senior management strategy. We need it for cost reduction programs, okay? Like Mary Peterson was asked to do. This is undertaken continuously before production, during production, and after production. All product line workers are members of cost reduction circles. And finally, we need it for good cost control. So all of this control framework is used for cost control. This is undertaken when production starts and includes personal observations of line workers, overall financial measures to see trends, for example, inventory turnover, and non-financial performance measures, for example, lead time, setup time, etc. The whole host of these uh, calculations, non-financial measures, and achievement of cost reduction measures. So that's what we need. Now that includes what we are going to call back plus costing, that is, how do we change the cost accounting system to reduce the cost of running the cost accounting system? Okay, so there is an example in your notes that is quite detailed about the back plus costing. Okay. With all the entries. But Right at the end of the uh, section, before the hair study, there is uh, something in the box saying, example for self-study, okay? Key information, purchase of raw materials, 120 units, etc. Do you see that little box there? Okay, at the uh, end. So I'm going to use that information to do a bit of simple black first costing on the board. So here is the information. Purchase of raw materials, 120 units at $100 a unit. <coughs> raw materials transfer to production, 110 units. Standard conversion cost, $100 per unit finished. Conversion cost used in production, $10,500. I'll show you what all this is. Means finished goods produced in the period, 100 units. Units sold in the period, 90 units at $300 a unit. So, in the normal job costing where we are going to follow a work order, you will be recording this every time one of these transactions happen, you'll be recording it in the cost accounting system. So let's look at that. see this uh, red board at the back. Okay, so I'm going to do an exercise in job order costing. Here is the raw material stores. Raw materials. Let us assume that there is no raw materials at the start, so it's an asset. Beginning balance zero, brought forward zero. And you're purchasing 120 units. So we'll have accounts payable, liability account, opening balance zero. So we're purchasing 12,000 units of raw materials. So to accounts payable, 12,000 raw material stores, 12,000. Now if I make a mistake, I put it on the wrong side, let me know, okay? Okay, so that's the recording of the first transaction. Second one, raw material transfer to production, 110 units. So now let's open a working process account. Asset account. Let's assume opening balance zero. <clears throat> so you're taking from the raw material account at cost to the working process account. 
11,000. 110 units at 100. And you're recording it there, 11,000. Okay, so second one recorded. Third, some information. Standard conversion cost is $100 per unit finish. Now the word conversion cost is the conversion of raw materials into a finished product, which means that a conversion cost is labor and overhead combined. Okay, so we keep that in our minds. Conversion cost used in production, 10,500. So these are the actual amount spent on labor and so on. Conversion cost. This is a period expense, so there's no opening and closing accounts. You're told that you paid cash or accruals, let's say cash, to your workers and for lighting and so on, 10,500. The double entry would be credit cash account, okay? Finished, uh, finished goods produced in the period, 100 units. So you're told that the moment you finish, this entry here, you're going to record the amount of conversion cost. So to the working process account, you're going to transfer uh, 100 units times 100, $10,000 is transferred to working process account. Okay, that's standard costing. Okay, finally, you're finishing 100 units, so now we'll open a finished goods account. Inventory account, asset, assume no opening balance. So from work in process to finished goods, you're transferring how much? 100 units. So that's 100 units is $100 raw materials, $100 finished uh, conversion cost, that's $200. So we are transferring. 20,000, is that correct? 100 times. No, no, <coughs> 200 times 100 is, yeah, 20,000 to finish goods. Okay, remember 100 is the raw material, 100 is the conversion cost per unit. Okay, any questions? Right. Conversion cost is 10,500, and we produce yeah, but we only recognize the conversion cost on, at standard cost of $100 a unit. So there's 500 that we haven't allocated. That will be over under, under applied overhead. Okay? Any other questions? Right, so then you're told that you sold 90. So now we have a couple of entries. We have cost of sales. That's an expense account, so we transfer from finished goods to cost of sales. 90 times 200 is 18,000 from finished goods. 18,000. And we have sales, revenue account, no opening balances there. $300 a unit times 90, so that is accounts receivable. Uh, 27,000 and accounts receivable which is an asset account let's assume opening balance nil sales 27,000 I'm tired now I deserve an increase in salary look at all the increase I have made on the board my job is very important <coughs> I'm now following the work order Job order costing, every time one of these items is triggered, I make an entry. And now, look at the work I have done. Should you give me a bonus, salary increase? Okay. Anyway, let's continue. So let us look at what the final balances are. At the end of the period, don't know if you can see that. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. 12,000. So closing balance, carry forward, 1,000. 
21,000 here. Carry forward 1,000. Finish goods carry forward 2,000. Conversion cost 10,500 was spent. We only brought to product cost 10,000. So there is to the profit and loss account, there would be an underapplied overhead of 500. Accounts payable, we have a creditor 12,000. And cost of sales is to the PL 18,000. Sales to the PL 27,000. That gives us a gross profit of 9,000 less the 500 under applied overhead. And accounts receivable, asset of 27,000. Okay, so let's look at the balance sheet items. Raw materials, 1,000. Work in process, 1,000. Finished goods, 2,000. Accounts receivable, 27,000 and accounts payable minus 12,000, right? Any questions? I know for some of you this is going back a couple of years, look at job water costing, but don't worry, there may be a solution to all this. Okay, so this is job order costing. Right, now can we do better? Can we reduce our workload? Rather than all the buff points, why don't we only record when we purchase, when we produce and finish, and when we sell. So what are we doing? We are going to eliminate the working process account. All that process costing eliminated. Okay, so let's see how we are going to do that. So this will be the same, purchase 12,000. But when we are transferring the fit working process, we don't record that at all. We are only going to record with the amount of materials that we use to finish. So <coughs> the amount of materials transferred to finished goods would be 100 times 100, 10,000. So from raw materials, you are getting 10,000. And conversion costs, we are already recording only when we finish. So instead of sending to the working process account, we send to the finished goods account. Okay. So now the closing balance in your the closing balance in the raw material account is 2000 some of it is raw materials in its PO4 others is mixed into the work in process so what we have done is we have combined the closing balance of these two and that's 2000 that's still the same 2000 that's still the same, 27,000, and that's minus 12,000. So no change in the final accounts. The auditor will be happy, but you have reduced an incredible amount of keeping track of all the products into work in process. What do you think? Now my workload is getting less. Okay. Can you do better? What about only two points? When we produce, 
and when we when you produce me when you finish the product and when we sell okay so what do I do here I eliminate the raw material apart remember that raw material stores will no longer be there because you're delivering straight to the workstation okay now how do I do the entries so this is where it becomes a bit interesting we don't we don't record purchases until we finish. So accounts payable will no longer be 12,000. It will be the amount of accounts payable or raw material that we finish, which means to finish goods, it will be 10,000. Okay, so from here, we only record the accounts payable or the creditors of the material that we finish. Okay, now let's look at the numbers. This becomes zero, no raw materials, no working process. Finished goods is still 2,000. Debtors, 27,000. But creditors has gone down to 10,000. So the balance sheet is still balanced. But will the auditor be happy? Because the reduction of the asset of 2,000 is recorded as the reduction of the liability of 2,000. So what does this mean? This means that we have purchased $2,000 worth of raw materials that is not in the books. And it will only come into the books when we finish. What do you think about that? As auditor, will you be happy? Hmm? Not at all. Huh? Anyone will be happy? We are under-representing our accounts payable. Okay, now, of course, if the numbers are like this, 2,000 is a large amount of money compared to 12,000, right? What percentage is that? That's about, uh, about what? A little over, about 15%, huh? 15, 16%. That's a lot. But in reality, think about Dell computers. The amount of finished goods, amount of raw materials that is still in the factory and not finished would be the last hour of production on the last day of the financial year. Negligible. Immaterial. And the next day when it, the production is finished, the supply is paid automatically. It's all automatic. The moment it's finished, the check goes out to the supplier. Okay. In that case, it is immaterial. You get my point? In a JIT situation, it will be the last hour of the last day of the financial year that we haven't recorded. But look at the amount of saving of time recording everything. But will there not be a discrepancy between the bank's confirmation that uh, the supply yeah. provides to a auditor? The <coughs> old method of confirmations from suppliers is long gone. Okay? Long gone. These sorts of companies, the supplier knows that they are going to get paid immediately, right? The money. And often you won't even get a confirmation. And if they do, they will basically confirm the amount. Because they know the next morning it's a very small negligible amount. Okay? So it won't be significant. Yes? Is the ownership of the material non produced shifted to the manufacturer or still with the supplier? No. In the case of the legal aspects, the, the manufacturer now owns the material because it's actually in the manufacturer's factory, but we, we have not recorded it. But this is as per IFRS? IFRS really doesn't, wouldn't be concerned because it is not material. If it is material, of course they'll be concerned. 
Does that mean you need a, a, a control system to to to, to reconcile between? What no, is not no, the, no rec the reconciliation is perfect. The balance sheet balances. All we have done is we have taken in the the supplies come and delivered onto our workstation. Some supplies on the last day, last hour. That we have not recorded yet in our system, but it will be clear the next day. Immaterial. There is another point. What about the, the material on transit? The material? On transit. Material, the material on transit is, is, uh, is still not reached to my premises from my supplier, or yes. material not reached to my client. Correct, but remember I told you that these are deliveries done three, four times a day. Right? right? So you are talking about the last delivery that might be in transit, immaterial, compared to earlier. Okay. Yes. With regard to this conversion process. Yes. In this case, we are under recognizing the process. Correct. Because I was over recognizing. That would be. I mean, we could have we could have done some production efficiencies and spent only nine thousand five hundred. So. But we will record in ten thousand. So understand. Correct, but once again, you got to look at the materiality. I mean, if you are, if you have managed to put the efficiencies here and you have not recognized it as part of your uh, standard costs, right? Next period, we have to change our standard costs. Okay. So we will have to. There will be a over, uh, in that case. In this case, it's underapplied overhead. In this case, underapplied. In other case, it will be overapplied, but not by very much. Okay, now maybe overapplied by five hundred. Sorry. Is it allowed? Yeah, yeah, you can overhead. I mean, that's allowed, okay? Because IFRS is not concerned about individual cost. They are looking at the overall picture. Is the profit figure correct, right? So where we show the cost as a product cost or a period cost, ultimately it will affect the profit and the inventory valuation, okay? But in this case, only the finished goods inventory at the moment, okay? There's no working process of finished goods inventory, uh, working process or raw material inventory. So good questions, but you can see these only for a GIT manufacturer. Okay, now the next one. Can we go even better? Only one point sale. Okay, in other words, we are only making two order. So we are going to eliminate the finished goods account. Now I'm getting worried because my job is slowly being erased from the board. Very soon, cost accountant has no job. Okay, so what is the logic here? The logic here is straightforward. If I sell the something, that means I made it. If I made something, that means I use raw materials and conversion costs. So why do I need to track it this way? Why don't, once I sell it, I flush the cost out of the system. Back flush, back, backward flushing the cost out of the system. Extract the cost out of the system. The word back flush sounds a bit funny, but essentially it means extract the cost backwards through the system. Okay, hence the method of back first costing. Now this is, the entries will be like this. So here, we don't recognize the supplier until the item is sold. But remember, we are selling a pre-order. So, when we sell, we will recognize the uh, raw material, so it goes straight into convert cost of sales, 9,000. Cost of sales, 9,000, sorry, from accounts payable. And conversion cost, only what is sold, so that goes to cost of sales, 9,000, 90 units at 100. So that's from where the 18,000 comes. And now, the question that was asked, in this case, you will have an even higher amount of underapplied overhead by 1,500. Okay, so the entries at the end, no inventory of raw materials, work in process or finished goods, accounts receivable still the same 27,000, 
but accounts payable has gone down to 9,000. The reduction from 10,000 to 9,000 is taken up by the extra conversion costs in the PNL. But that is the elimination of waste. Look at all the effort that I eliminated, recording all that through waiting until the product is finished under GIT principles.